My name is, uh, is uh, Ron Saporta, and we've got a, a panel here of, uh, of both staff and faculty from the University of Toronto, and we were hoping to talk today a bit about how we, uh, we walk the talk at U of T and how we take a bit of action uh, and really focusing on that latter segment of the overall uh, conference theme. So in terms of panelists today, so here starting uh, from, I guess it's my left, we have uh, Andrew, who's our Chief Administrative Officer from the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. Zahir is our Chief Administrative Officer from the University of Toronto Mississauga campus. And of course, at the end, there's David, who's our professor in our Faculty of Engineering and also the Canadian Research Chair on Energy and Fluid Something. Close enough. Yeah. Close enough. Energy and fluid <laughs> something. And I'm uh, Ron Support. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of our St. George campus. So our panel up here actually represents all three of our campuses, uh, also the, the leadership in our sustainability uh, committee, uh, as well as faculty uh, related to that research that you're here about today that's, that's related to, to our conversation. Unfortunately, one of our other faculty members that was supposed to join us today, Liat, uh, couldn't attend. Uh, so I do, uh, we do uh, apologize and you'll see an empty chair as a result. But I'll jump right into it. What we were hoping to do today from a format perspective is give you a bit of a, a, a background into what we're doing at the university. Right, so I'll talk a bit about, if I can get this working, it looks like myself and the gentleman this morning have the same challenge. Ha ha, there we go. Okay, works. So we were going to thank you. We we're going to talk a bit today about the university and, and our low carbon action plan. And I'll talk about that. And it's really a tri campus action plan that you'll see all the various different initiatives that we hope to undertake to, to address uh, the challenge of, of climate change and carbon. Uh, but then we're going to have an opportunity for what I think is, is hopefully going to be a very interesting conversation where we can do a deeper dive into, into our different campuses. Uh, with the leadership there walking us through what sustainability looks like, what partnerships look like in this space, and, and then of course, uh, what some of the research looks like and what we're doing in, in and around this area with, the, with David presenting that. So I'll jump into it, and, and most people are likely aware of what, what the University of Toronto is. Uh, I like to call us a city within a city. When you look at our overall population across all three campuses, it's well in excess of 110,000 when you look at our students, staff, and faculty. And when you do a little Wikipedia search, and we have a lot of arguments about this in the office, it puts us in and around the 32nd largest city uh, in the country which I think is quite meaningful because when you look at what we do at the university, especially from an operations perspective, we have all of the services that you find in a city. We have utilities, we have a police force, we've got fire services, we've got properties, pretty much everything that happens in a city, uh, we run uh, for our campuses. And to me, that's quite meaningful because when you start to look at how we're overcoming the challenge, I think we have an opportunity to show not just other academic institutions, but the broader community, municipalities, and even provinces around uh, one way we think uh, we could be tackling this. So what does that mean? Well, from our perspective, this is not something that we're proud of. We win the bronze medal in the province of Ontario as being the dirtiest or carbon intensive a public institution only behind the city and all of the Toronto District School Board when you take their 400 plus schools together, we are just marginally less. So we get the bronze medal and being the, the best of the worst, I guess is one way of putting it. Um, but we do have uh, a goal and our goal is to be 37% below our 1990s level by the year 2030. It took me about a year to memorize that statement, but it's, uh, I think it's an important and ambitious target uh, that we have in the short term uh, in terms of how we want to tackle uh, our carbon. What does that look like for the numbers people in the room? I'm an engineer, so I love to go back to, to sort of numbers and projections. In 1990, our total macro level emissions were in and around 117,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, and our goal would be to put that down below 73,000, or sorry, below 74,000. And you can see that the last reported year that we have, we basically hit the 1990s level. And that's something that I think is quite a positive note or else most people would look at me and be like, you're at the exact same number. How could that be positive? Well, it's positive because we more than doubled our student body at the same time frame. We've also more than doubled the size of our campuses from a gross square foot perspective and a level of activity we have. So when you look at it from an intensity perspective, uh, and that's what that black line is, you can see that intensity has gone down significantly over that time frame. But we realize that we've got a long way to go to hit this 1973, sorry, 73,000 target. Um, the other important part to note in all of this is that we anticipate that our growth will continue, but our target is absolute. And that's what this dark green bar sort of represents up here. If we continue business as usual, we're not gonna be at where we were in 1990, we're gonna be significantly higher. So when we talk about our low carbon action plan, it's not about getting this down to there. 
It's about getting all of our growth aspirations and all of our current uh, issues down to where our target is. So it's, it's a bit larger of a challenge than it would appear on face. In terms of how our, 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 our missions are split up, about 85% of that is, is in our downtown campus and roughly 10% each you know, with some rounding in, in uh, Mississauga and in Scarborough respectively. Oops. So when we tackled, when we, when we put together a plan to tackle this, we came up with an initial framework. And I would like to start with that framework before we start to get to projects and how do we tackle this. And our framework focuses on uh, three main components. And first of which is the production of energy. We then take that and we distribute our energy between our, not in between the campuses, but within the campuses. And then ultimately uh, we consume. And although I know that's the way it looks like from an energy perspective, it stands to argue, and you'll see in a moment why, that the last one is the most important one in terms of ensuring that we're reducing how much we consume in the first place so that we then have to distribute less and ultimately produce less. Uh, when we talk about these goals in each of these categories, we also sort of have themes. So on the production side, our, our focus area is on producing as clean as we can. And we'll talk a bit more about that today. And then where we can't produce cleanly, start to look to carbon capture type solutions. And you know, David will talk a bit more about that in, in detail. Um, then we wanna distribute as efficiently as possible. We have significant uh, distributed energy systems in all of our campuses. <coughs> and ultimately I talked a bit about the, the reduction. So we, we are starting from, uh, I call a position of success so because in a handful of months ago, we finished what we call the GGRP projects or the greenhouse gas uh, reduction uh, projects, which is a tri-campus initiative of around 12 projects. Uh, and all of those were completed at the beginning of this year uh, and are targeted to reduce about 8,600 tons per year, which is quite a, a good uh, initial sort of kick at that can. Then we start to look at the projects that we're proposing within these different frameworks. And, and the one of them that we, we, def, we like to highlight is how we are exploring expanded use of geothermal or more specifically and more appropriately named geo exchange. And we could talk probably an hour about the differences, but we won't. Just take my word for it. Uh, and we're looking at geo exchange projects actually right across all three of our campuses or from, uh, from putting a significantly large one that's slated to be the largest in Canada in an urban setting, right in the heart of our, our this is historic heart actually of our downtown campus, but also some quite innovative solutions that you hear about later today in both our Mississauga and our, and our Scarborough campuses that make up quite a significant projected portion of, of reduced uh, carbon emissions. We also have a significant commitment to renewable energies and producing as much as we can on campus. And one example of that is uh, committing to doubling the amount of solar type energy that we produce on our campuses. Now this is significantly different. We're talking about only 200 tons. And a lot of people ask me, why do you bother talking about 200 tons when your, previously slide, your previous slide, pardon me, talked about 16,000 tons? And the one point that I like to make in and around here is that we often, especially in operations, have this pressure that we need to balance between carbon and between cost. And many people may not be aware of this, but in our jurisdiction in Ontario, uh, electricity is about eight times cleaner than burning natural gas uh, to produce the same, same amount of energy on an energy basis. But it's significantly more expensive. It's actually in excess of four times the cost. So when we start to pull together these programs, we like to pull together programs that look at reducing consumption holistically, not just the thermal. And if you focus on the thermal, you'll get the carbon, but it's important to also look at the electrical so that we can balance our costs and our carbon and do it in a really balanced portfolio type way. So this might be a small number, but to me it's equally as important from a, a financial perspective. I won't spend too much time here because you're gonna see this group of individuals and, and David talking about them momentarily, but where we started to, to, to look at a lot of um, focus uh, in operations is partnering with our academic uh, researchers in and around carbon capture. And you hear about one of those projects today, but we actually have numerous projects that are occurring on our campuses uh, that focus on how we can capture that carbon and, and use it uh, in a more effective way. So distribution for us is extremely important. Many people might not be aware of this, but the St. George campus, the, uh, we have an, a district energy system that's one of the oldest in Canada. It's about, a, about to hit its 120th birthday. Uh, and maybe we'll have a, a big party or a cake, the shape of a boiler or something exciting like that. But uh, it gives us a huge opportunity for a demonstration projects in and around district energy systems and how we can leverage district energy systems uh, to address a lot of our carbon problems or carbon challenges. And uh, what we've set ourselves to target is to reduce the carbon losses that are associated with that distribution system itself. 
Uh, and uh, so there will be, you'll see over the coming years, many projects in and around this that are focused on, on that distribution. A couple of examples of that is uh, things around heat recovery, that we have an opportunity to ensure that we are extracting the most heat uh, out, of the, out of those plants. Uh, so that then on a per energy unit basis, we're lowering that carbon demand. And also solutions such as steam to hot water conversions that we're doing uh, out in some of our campuses that once again, lower the carbon intensity of that thermal energy we're creating. And lastly, and I, and I mentioned this right off the bat as being the most important one, um, in that it's the consumption. And from my perspective, I, I've always argued that the cleanest and cheapest form of energy out there is the one that we don't use. So if we want to tackle our carbon challenge, and if we want to do that in a financially responsible way, we should avoid consuming it in the first place. This graph up here is all of our buildings, 125 some odd buildings on the St. George campus, where we took uh, the data that we had and we looked at how much carbon are we producing to support that building on a per GSM or per gross square meter basis. And you can see that there's quite a wide variety of distribution. And when we look at it, the average right now is sitting at just above 69 kilograms per square meter. And if we take what our target is, including growth, we need to bring that average down to 32, um, which on its own is, is you know, quite uh, difficult. It's a 50% reduction on an average basis. But what I always like to emphasize is that uh, you can't always just take this data on face value. And what I mean by that is the buildings up here are not necessarily the worst performing buildings. They tend to be the heavy science buildings that use more energy as a result, more laboratories, things of that nature. And that we should start to do comparisons and our next step is to do that within peer groups. Because conversely, actually, there's a lot of buildings down here that you would think are low, relatively speaking, but they tend to be the administrative buildings and some of them actually are performing fairly poorly compared to other administrative buildings. So our next step in the evolution of this type of analysis is to start to look on it on a peer basis. Uh, peer building type basis. So with that in mind, we've launched uh, a process that we call USCO. You might be familiar with the ESCO model. It's a, a widely used model in the private sector where you bring in an energy performance company uh, and they guarantee carbon savings. And when we were thinking about this group, they come and they, they bring to you uh, capital and they bring to you knowledge. And we started to think about that within the university and started to look at some of our buildings and sort of challenged ourselves saying, well, hold on, we could probably get capital at a cheaper rate or an equivalent rate than a private sector partner could produce. Uh, but at the same time, we are probably sitting on a greater knowledge base than these private partners. So we've launched a pilot project a handful of months ago to look at one building and to try to outperform what you would see in a traditional ESCO model. So instead of having bringing a private sector partner to do this on a for-profit basis, we leveraged our internal knowledge, partnered with people in, in academics to come up with a, a project that we could do <laughs> internally. Um, so that's something that we're hoping we're gonna see results in the coming months. But from a larger perspective, right across our consumption and all of our building portfolios and all three campuses, we've set a target to reduce that carbon by about 6,000 uh, tons. The other piece, I talked about the dark bar that represents growth and that we know that we're not living in a static world, that we, we are going to grow and we have those aspirations. So we wanted to ensure that part of our plan, we're make, we are enabling that growth in a responsible fashion. And we're in the, right now just about to complete the development of a new uh, energy performance standard, one that's definitely going to be uh, more aggressive uh, than we've seen in the past, but also uh, easier to implement and a bit more realistic, which sounds a bit at odds. Um, and we've had a team working on this for probably about five, six months now to try to balance those two. And in the coming months, we will have that out. And our projection when we model this uh, in terms of our growth and the carbon that we're avoiding, because we don't actually, we're not producing this carbon today, but we're avoiding those emissions uh, is well in excess of this target uh, so far. Um, so, and you'll hear about one or two projects today that actually exceed uh, these energy performance targets and do that in a way that uh, is quite uh, sustainable uh, in the broadest sense of that term. Oop. An example we like to talk about, you may have heard about our academic wood tower. Now, this is a project that tackled sustainability beyond just direct carbon emissions, but started to look at life cycle carbon, embedded carbon, and how we can use alternate materials uh, to create spaces uh, that, that, that meet the demand of the university. So not only is it well below the average, so we're projecting this building just from an energy perspective would be around 14 carbons. Remember that average target for it was 32. So we're well below that, but it's also using materials that are far more sustainable uh, than you would in traditional type applications. 
And then lastly uh, is LED lights. It's probably one of the simplest projects, low hanging fruit projects, but campuses of our size where we have over 22 million square feet of space uh, on all three campuses, you'd be surprised how many of our older buildings still don't use this technology. Um, so from our perspective, that's great. This is a great news story for us in terms of being able to tackle some of that low hanging fruit and address uh, our larger challenge. And, and before I sort of final or close off on some of those strategies, the other one I, I love to talk about is what we're doing in, a, in the, uh, the forestry offset type uh, environment. And we call that carbon, our carbon stock and carbon sequestering. And we actually own uh, as a university, a significant amount of forest plots that are beyond just our three campuses. The map over here, this is for our, Cough our Cothler Science Reserve, which is just about 50, 60 kilometers north of the city. Uh, but we also have uh, other areas such as our survey camp by Gall Lake, we have Hart House Farm. And we've partnered with the Faculty of Forestry to help us better understand how much carbon from an additional perspective are we sequestering on an annual basis. And they came back to us with a number that we weren't anticipating. And in fact, if you look at just the urban settings, our three urban campuses are about 1,000 tons of carbon a year. Uh, but when you look at all of our properties, it's about 5,000 tons. So it's not something to, you know, we're not going to be packaging this in a forestry offset type solution or anything of that nature. But from our perspective, to be able to understand and address what our forests are doing for us was key. But more important than that, this provides us for an opportunity, what we call a campus of a living lab. And we heard about that this morning, the keynote address, but this project was put together with a group of grad students. And our intention moving forward is to start to create graduate level courses and field schools to help us implement active forestry management to increase those numbers, but at the same time, provide experiential learning opportunities for our students uh, and to start to leverage a lot of the assets that we have in a way to provide the education that's aligned with our, our ultimate goal. There are other examples of campus of a living lab type uh, uh, projects. Um, over here, we've got an example of a, um, a fume hood project uh, that we worked on. Uh, our students came up with a methodology to test the effectiveness of fume hoods and ensure you're getting that place, face velocity that you need from a safety perspective. But instead of using traditional methods, they were able to come up with a very rapid cycle. We're using lasers and smoke. It's really high tech and neat. Uh, but allows us to do that test in a very short period of time. So instead of having to do random sampling, we can actually now do all of our fume hoods. Uh, so there's a good savings there from a cost perspective, but also the use of coming up with a, an innovative way, innovative way of, of uh, performing that test, all developed by one of our students. This is the grad student that, that worked on that, on that project. So what does this look like when you put it all together? Uh, from 2015, you can see here where we were and what that would look like on what we call a sort of a business as usual met, uh, track, where we have growth in our buildings, growth in our activities, and well above this dotted line here, which is the base. But if I add up those projects that I just talked to and, and all of those targets and goals that we have, you can see how they start to overlay. We end up about 75% of our way to our 2030 target. And this is through the, the, the next five years in the, in the action plan that we have which does leave us with a bit. We know we're not there all the, way, all the way, but we also know that we've got five years after this to, to come up with that last component. So from an overarching perspective, we were quite purposeful in wanting to take a, a measured approach. We took five years because we thought that that was a time frame that was uh, reasonable, something that we could project projects forward on a, with a certain level of certainty. Uh, and we're surprised to find out that we could actually tackle the, the majority of our, our challenges uh, through that. So if you're interested specifically in the low carbon action plan, we do have on our sustainability website, you can, you can download it. There are copies here you can, you can walk away with if, if you'd like. Um, but what we're hoping to do with the remainder of our time today is to uh, turn the conversation over to a couple more focused components that are not just within this plan, but to give you a bit more flavor as to what we're doing to, to walk the talk. So with that, I'll turn it over to Seher from, uh, from the University of Toronto, Mississauga to talk to us about sustainability at UTM. Thank you, Ron. That was great. And thank you for bringing me here. But welcome to all of you who are coming here for the first time. So welcome to this uh, University of Toronto Mississauga campus. As uh, Ron mentioned, uh, the, the sustainability effort is a tri-campus effort. And um, we'll hear from, from Andrew too. Um, but something that we have, and I'm told, I've just been here a year, 
but I'm told what the first uh, office that was established in sustainability was established here at Mississauga. And so where we have um, come this far, and again, a long way to go, as I said in the morning, is that we integrate the decision, in every decision that we make, we, we put in sustainability first. And as you would hear uh, throughout uh, this uh, Presentation uh, and presentations uh, in this uh, in this panel discussion uh, that uh, sustainability is is core. So just to give you a sense of the Mississauga campus, everything that's in gray was built uh, by 2004. Between 2004 and 2019, we've had everything that's in color. So you can see how much growth has happened. Now, unlike the St. George campus, Mississauga campus is fairly young. And uh, it is, it was, uh, it's been there for 50 plus years. So there has been a substantial growth over the last 15 years. There have been various uh, motivators in driving these changes uh, and uh, environmental responsibility, our, our, our um, partnership with the city of Mississauga. So uh, we heard a lot about what the three campuses are doing on side of design, construction, uh, carbon footprint. But what I need to also emphasize that I'm, all the three campuses are also focusing on every other area. So it's just not um, on, on the design construction piece, but you know, technological management, energy, waste recycling. Um, we're literally trying to walk the talk and so, um, so focusing on the green building side, um, again, uh, most of you here would be familiar with the, the uh, LEED silver design and our focus has been on water saving energy, material selection, indoor air quality. We have a lot of green buildings on campus um, and I would ask you to, to actually attend, um, and I have Emma and Chelsea here, um, a discussion on our newest science building. And that's as Ron mentioned, that there are some projects that are really taking them to a second level. And this is one of those buildings where though you can see them as a, a, a lead silver target, actually our recent assessments shown us that we are now targeting gold. So that, could, that is a little bit of an older information, but we want to keep it conservative um, so that we meet what we, uh, what we promise, but I think so we'll be doing better. What we are right now targeting is that it would be, um, if not North America's, Canada's for sure, most energy efficient lab environment. So we take a lot of pride. I know Emma will, and Chelsea will have a lot more detail to share with you. It's really um, something that we are looking forward to. The groundbreaking, if you're here, will happen in the next uh, six weeks. So um, it's beautiful. And, and also attend, uh, please, if you have time, and if the weather uh, permits, please attend the campus tours, because th they will show you where the new building's going, and they will also talk to you about what other things that we are doing. I mean, I'm going to talk about some of them very quickly over here. So um, we have 21 sites on this 225-acre land that we sit on. Uh, removed from mowing. Um, we, have, uh, we have a geothermal, we have solar system. So those of you who were uh, in the uh, IV building, that building has a beehive uh, on its roof. It has a solar um, paneling that works both as a, a shade, uh, a sunshade, as well as um, it's a, a couple of solar areas over there. So again, innovation within our, our um, capacities is what we are focusing on. Um, white roofs, again, everyday thinking, everyday design thinking involves uh, sustainability. We're trying to leverage grants and incentives because uh, funding and, and support from the government is very important in our mission. Again, I know we're going to take a little bit deeper dive, um, but all opportunities come challenges and uh, economies of scale, financial support from the political side to a public university is also very important. As I mentioned earlier on, um, sustainability is not only just in our construction and facility side of business, it's in all the other aspects. So we have a UPASS. Uh, that you can, um, the students would get in the beginning of the year and then they can use on all Missis city of Mississauga buses. We have 
uh, a dedicated bus running from the city of Brampton to the campus. We have uh, parking rebates for fuel efficient vehicles. We have a bike share program. Um, we have annual community bike ride led by Chelsea. Um, we have a lot of community engagement. And as Ron mentioned, a low hanging fruit, LED retrofit. But as he also said that uh, though it's low hanging, there's a lot of coverage to be done. We've already embarked on it. Um, we have exam jams, we have uh, community engagement, there is a waste sorting game, there's uh, uh, tours of central utility plant, um, there is a dish service, so we are our retail um, and food services would provide reusable cups to each of the department so that the waste is minimized. And we have repair cafes, as I mentioned in the morning. If your clothes need mending, your sweater is not, um, is getting a little old, uh, if your toaster is not working, we have two days on campus where you can bring everything and get it fixed. And it's just not that the UTM community is doing uh, what it needs to do to, to be sustainable. We have a zero waste market. So the community from outside actually comes and sets stable here and, uh, and uh, sells recyclable uh, things. And then that money is used to help the community. In the food service area, um, there, there's food diversion goal. And, and the thing, the, the motto that our, my director of retail and food services always reminds me is diverting waste at where it's generated. So we have food compactors in our kitchens where uh, the, the organics are recycled uh, and, and properly disposed so that um, better use can be made and we minimize the waste. Uh, sorry, and I, I know I mentioned about the uh, bees. We have uh, bee farming just in the building that we were there in the morning, and a thousand pounds of uh, honey gets harvested every year. Living lab, wording of farming. If you go around, and um, as I said, if the tours do happen, given the uh, if the weather is, is supportive, then we have uh, vertical farming that's distributed and the produce that's uh, generated from there is, gets used in our kitchen cap, uh, in our cafeteria kitchen. We're moving towards a fair trade, trade commitment of the campus. We have plastic straws uh, on campus are almost gone. Uh, uh, we're taking it to even on the technology side um, we're using pin, uh, client technology, or we're reducing our data center footprints, uh, uh, managing between uh, cloud and various other technologies available. And I know um, Ron talked about 1990, but in, at the Mississauga campus, we have been measuring since 2005. So we've set our targets from 2005 onwards. And we have done a lot, but there's lots need to be done to get to where we want to go. Thank you. Thank you. Again, just a reminder, please uh, try to attend the 430 Science Building. We're really proud of that building. It will be a cutting edge building, so hopefully you will stay here for 430 and listen to him and then Chelsea if you have a chance. Thank you very much, Sahara. I think it's a, I really appreciated your presentation because the, one of the big contrasts, and I know I get called out on this a lot, is, is of late I talk about our low carbon action plan. And it's an, a carbon action plan. It only focuses on that. But uh, what's important to mention is that when we talk to sustainability, we do talk to it in that broader sense. So I really appreciate you, you giving an opportunity to summarize that for us because the type of activities you see at UTM are, are mirrored in Scarborough and in other areas because we do take that broader angle to sustainability. So maybe I'll turn it over to Andrew, who's going to talk to us about, uh, about the importance of partnerships and how we do this, and that we're not always in on it alone. So here's my segue for you. Thanks very much, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I've jumped ahead already. Um, so really, what I'd like to talk to the group about is a different perspective. And so I, unlike my colleagues, I'm not an engineer. I'm a neuroscientist by training. And in neuroscience, we always look at connections. It's, it's mapping pathways and, and building connections. So I've taken a slightly different approach. Um, but I do hope you get something from this. 
Um, this is the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. We're the largest campus in the U of T system in terms of geography. We are the smallest campus in, term, uh, in terms of the student population. Uh, we're just slightly smaller than uh, UTM. It's a really unique um, feature that I'll, I'll quickly walk you through. Um, so the original campus was built in by the, with the John Andrews building, which is here in uh, the mid 1960s and opened in the late 1960s. And then the campus began to sort of fill in around that building. We have about 150 acres of protected ravine land. And we have this North Campus, which is historically the site of parking lots. Um, part of the reason for that is it's a landfill site. It's a former landfill site. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we went through an exercise in 2007, 2008 to begin to develop a new vision for a new campus. Um, and what we did is we actually brought the community together. and. We uh, brought faculty, staff, students, politicians, environmental leaders to think about what a new university ought to look like and how you ought to build um, a contemporary university. And as a result of that, we heard some really strong comments. And part of what really resonated uh, from the master planning exercise, which is now generalized out, is that we had very little presence uh, in uh, the Scarborough community. We've been there for 50 years. Uh, we haven't done a great job at employing people. We haven't done a great job at advocating for people. Um, people knew that we were there, but we weren't relevant. So one of the things that we really tried to do is focus everything that we did academically, administratively, operationally, about leveraging and engaging community and creating opportunities for the areas around us and really begin to be loud and, and to celebrate some of those changes. And as a result of this exercise, and I've, I've just fast forwarded about four years of planning, uh, we developed a new UTSC campus master plan. And really what you see in the master plan in the earlier site, this was all parking lots. And the idea was that we have about 6 million square feet of development capacity. And we really need to think about as we develop this campus about what the sustainability objectives for us are. And, we've, and we know there's not a singular one. There's opportunities to do multiple different things. And really what we've decided to do is to examine every project that we have and look for those things that we can best leverage on, on every project. Um, so we've been plugging away at this. this. This master plan is really something that I hope my great-great-grandchildren can complete at some point. This is a hundred-year plan for a university. This is not something that's going to happen over time, and we needed to build enough flexibility that we can adapt to new technologies and so forth, both academically and operationally. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of sustainability cycle. And there's a million different models. This is just one that I, I sort of identified. And that is we identify where there's a need for something. And the target could be reducing carbon. Then we go through a process about what the best um, ideas are and how we can actually do that. Then we begin to prototype in the sort of innovation phase and demonstrate that this works. And then we go to an implementation phase. And then we evaluate, which then comes back to the need. So this is. You can think about the cycle in a million different ways, but notionally, this is uh, what's important uh, or what we think about around sustainability. One of the things that I will argue is that we tend to focus a lot on the big boxes um, or the big circles in this case. I apologize for uh, mix, mixing that up. But re well, really, there's supposed to be a slide here. Uh, but really, um, it's really about what connects those things. It's, it's about what connects the arrows. And that's really what I'm going to talk about. And I, I'll hopefully explain this by the end of the presentation. And so I'll walk through a few of the projects. And so in uh, 2014, we started work on the Environmental Science and Chemistry Building. It's a really complex building. It has 140 fume hoods in it. It moves a ton of air through. Uh, and at the same time, RBC was developing the Water Park Place. And there's a little bit of bitterness in me because they beat us on every single environmental award competition that we entered. And I started to think, well, why is that? And the reason is what they have to bring forward in terms of funny and funding, in terms of resources, is different than what we do at a university. So RBC has a great address at the foot of um, York Street, a uh, beautiful view of the lake, and their investment strategy as their core business is to build assets, create value in those assets, and generate value long-term in those assets. That's not what we do at a university. We build academic infrastructure that's meant to support the core academic mission. And often the choices that we have before us are things like, do we add another classroom or another lab, or do we actually do something to move uh, another environmental initiative? So the metrics are different. And so um, 
it's not to say that one is good and one is bad. It's just they're very different. So for RBC, every dollar they put into this building, they get out of it because all the, all, all the renters in that building are willing to pay for the address. They're willing to pay for the technology. And they can fundamentally change. Um, if we go to lead platinum, we have to do things like introduce electric service vehicles and things which become important in terms of it changes the entire system and fleets that we have. So not saying that we shouldn't do it. It's just it, it's a different kind of complexity. So what we did with the environmental science and chemistry building is we took an approach with partnership where we actually held money. We, it was a design build project. So effectively, we defined how the project needed to perform at completion. Um, and then it was the obligation of the design build team to help to ensure that the building performed in that way. We held aside some dollars um, for environmental and sustainable innovations. It was about a million and a half, two million dollars that we held aside. And then we actually got the teams really engaged to fix this problem. And again, the issue with this building was it pumps a lot of air out because of the fume hoods, right? So air is being drawn from rooms and being pumped out of the building. So anything that we could do to actually reduce the cost of conditioning the air, heating or cooling the air was going to add a significant savings because of the volume moving out. So we did a few in, in innovative things. And one piece is we installed a large geothermal well uh, system underneath the building, or as Ron points out, not geo well, I said geothermal well, so I'm okay with that, but you're, you're calling them geothermal geochains. Geo there you go. Um, which was one piece, and this was a technology that existed. What was new was this technology here, and these are earth tubes. Incredibly complicated technology. No, actually, it's not. It's really simple. It's actually drawing back to living in caves. You basically put in large concrete culverts, you draw the air, you bury them deep enough underground that they stay at a constant temperature, and you draw the air through those culverts. Um, and when the air enters the building, it's conditioned. So where it really helps is in the height of summer and in the depths of winter. So uh, 32 degrees Celsius outside, the air comes through the geothermal or the um, earth tubes. It's about 22 degrees before it actually hits the air conditioning system, which means that the cooling, we're only cooling and conditioning the air for a couple of degrees as opposed to 20. And it does the inverse in the winter. It warms the air before it gets into the building. Uh, there are six foot big concrete sewer culverts that we've used. So this entire um, innovation was about $800,000 net new to a project that was about $70 million. And the geothermal wells were about a million. So it was about just under $2 million of innovation, uh, as well as the airflow and how the airflow handles in the system. I won't get into the technical details. But that reduced about 40% of what we were um, going to need for energy consumption. And so what happened is this was the largest installation of earth tubes in the country. So the National Research Council came in. They've now done measures and they're working on changing building code to accept this. So the, the university, we took a lot of risk. It took a lot of time with the city to manage the process to get these approved. Now what we've done is we've reached out to industry partners. So one of our big employers in, in close to the campus um, does a, a powder coating. Um, paint powder coating and what they end up doing is they powder coat large steel surfaces and then bake them and so their area of expertise is powder coating doors for uh, American Navy aircraft carriers so those doors all get shipped up to Scarborough they're actually strip painted and that you can just imagine the size of the ovens and the amount of heat that that generates so we have brought them in and on there on we've shared all the data we've not taken any kind of proprietary piece of it and and demonstrated this earth tube piece so their new a manufacturing facility will actually have earth tubes because for them it's a significant reduction in what they're producing um, in terms of uh, carbon and reducing and improving the quality for the people that, that are in there. So this is sort of one example. Another example is the Pan Am, uh, Toronto Pan Am Sports Center. Um, this is the very north part of the campus. Um, what you see here is the large landfill hill. So this was a 1950s dump site. Uh, and when we partnered with the city to build the Pan Am Center, I insisted we actually put it on this corner and everybody pushed against it because there's a landfill site there and it would increase the cost because we'd have to work through a remediation project. My thinking was the only chance we were ever going to remediate this land is if we managed to get the federal government, the provincial government, the municipal government, the organizing committee and the university on the same page with a really hard deadline. So we kind of dug in our heels. And sure enough, it worked. We moved a, uh, and cleaned a 25 acre landfill site, uh, which is now where the Pan Am facility sits. Uh, we've now, you can see there's a barrier wall system that is a methane capture system so that we no longer have leaching because there's 
methane moves with water table and the water table flows down through the campus. So we've resolved that and ad addressed our methane issue. And what we were able to do after we moved the materials is we just sunk the building inside the hole that was left behind. Because it has pools and gymnasiums, expensive areas to heat and cool, once you put those facilities underground, it's significantly uh, less variable in terms of where the temperatures are. So it actually generated significant savings. And so in this case, it was a partnership that we brought together with all levels of government in a really tight timeline that made this happen in the ministry the provincial ministry of the environment put together a special task force so that we could move through the approvals uh, expeditiously another example is something that we've recently done i've shown you the the campus itself it has really beautiful valleys it's re it's been really disappointing for us that about 15 percent of the campus population ever went down in the valley and one of the things that we and part of the challenge is it was a completely non-accessible path so that if you had any kind of mobility issue, you wouldn't be able to get down there. Um, so we've recently just opened our new uh, Valleyland uh, trail. And what you'll see if you, if you sort of follow the cursor here, the trail itself is the serpentining course that goes down. And the reason that it's serpentine so much is we wanted to have a grade of less, of no steeper than 5% anywhere along the trail. Um, so in order to do that, we had to elevate certain sections of the trail. And so we opened the trail, um, the day uh, after Labor Day this year. Um, and now all of a sudden, the, the number of people that are using the valley ha has shot up by 300%. Everybody seems to be taking walks down there. The reason that's important is this is a really important piece of um, environmental um, uh, supported landscape. There's deer, fox, um, we have now wild turkeys. And, and a lot of students and a lot of our community don't have an experience this kind of space before. So this is actually really connecting people to um, the lands. And, and on this one, we really worked hard with the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority because they'd never done anything like this before. So it was about a year and a half of planning and we walked this trail probably 40 times with them identifying certain trees and making sure that the trail sort of was outside of its drip line. And, great deal of detailed planning. And I think they learned a lot about working with the university on this project. The other is we've been very close to the indigenous community. Um, and uh, the, it's part of what we're trying to do is to capture uh, that. And then finally, we're building the Passive House uh, New Student Residence. Um, this project is, is touching on uh, the last point that Ron was making, where what, we've done, what we're doing in this project is creating a very solid envelope of a building. And it will actually reduce our consumption by about 85% from the heating um, perspective. And so basically you build a big thermos and then you don't need to um, exchange temperature so, so much. Uh, it certainly is 100% fresh air. Part of the reason we wanna do this is because every year, this will be a first year student residence, we'll have 750 new people have, that will cycle through this, which means 10 years from now, 7,500 people um, will have experienced living in Passive House. That puts significant pressure on development community to begin to deliver these kinds of projects. It creates a need for that community as well. Um, we are working with a public-private, in a public-private partnership to deliver this. So it's a great way to bring the public sector or the private sector on side with us. But the big issue is contractors and trades. That uh, we did bid this project once before. It came significantly higher uh, than what was costed um, because of the unknowingness of having ever, no one in Toronto has ever built a passive house uh, at this scale. They've only been small residential models. So now what we're doing is we're actually working directly with each of the trade unions and an apprentice program through the Central Ontario Buildings Trades to begin to use that as a platform to educate people around passive house and what's required and try to de-risk the project. We are also hosting, uh, starting this evening, the, uh, passive house, the National Passive House Conference at the campus which will have architects, developers, builders, all in attendance learning about Passive House. In these things, what they do is they de-risk they de for us the delivery of the project. Um, and so really what, what I'm trying to uh, suggest that as we do this is all of us have pressures around dollars uh, and it's always a challenge. Um, but partners can help drive innovation if you uh, give them the right platforms to help us achieve our sustainability um, uh, targets. Um, sharing lessons is really important. The more that we're able to take what we're learning on campus and making that um, part of what uh, industry and other partners are interested in, the better it is uh, in terms of driving price down, increasing demand for certain uh, materials and, and so forth. 
Um, connecting people with the environment helps re really reinforce, and that's what the Valley Land Trail does. Uh, and in creating system change, we must think broadly about who's impacted, right? And so just because we have a great idea, if there isn't a appropriate um, group of builders, designers, and operators, there's a lot of risk that we introduce. And, and so really understanding that at the start of a project is important. And the lastly, we really have to share what we, what we learn and listen to what others have to say about the kinds of projects we do. And so with that, just, it's, it's about the arrows, it's about those connections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's, it's quite interesting that, that presentation. If there's one thing that, that I take away from it, and I'm gonna do the, take the liberty of just going back one slide. Remember the arrows. And when we talked, uh, the keynote speaker this morning talked about the different types of mindsets that we have. I think he talked about the cruise and he talked about the exploration. And uh, you know, what I took away from that conversation was that the key element isn't so much the boat, but it's how we make sure we, we have that interaction between the different things working. And, and Andrew talked about so something very similar about that notion of remembering the arrow. So it's a, a good theme for us today, so thank you. So maybe I'll turn it over to, to David. I, I gave a brief introduction about earlier and David's gonna turn the conversation a little bit and talk a bit more about research and how we're starting to apply our research to tackle this problem. Thanks, Ron, and thanks for the, uh, the opportunity to, to speak to this topic today. And just reflecting on, the, on uh, my co-panelists, uh, great points and and I like um, the focus on efficiencies and if we can avoid as Ron says if we can avoid uh, consuming energy then that's job one right to to uh, to increase efficiencies looking further out and thinking about the university as a whole more than more than buildings more than systems more than power generation it houses great minds uh, mostly students some professors as well have <laughs> great minds um, and can we leverage those? Can the university partner with, with, uh, with researchers and develop technologies that are a little further out? And, and further out makes sense because as you've heard from, from the panelists, the uh, facilities already has impressive teams tackling uh, um, challenges that are job one right now in our universities and our structures and our buildings and our processes. Um, a little further out, are there things where the university can contribute and we can partner uh, to make further advances. And there's a growing appreciation that CO2 conversion is going to be needed. Right? There's, there's a certain amount of CO2 emissions that will always be with us. It's part of our modern lifestyle. And how do we do that CO2 conversion in a useful and efficient way and bring it back into products? A general overview of global energy. Uh, this is just one slide, but it kind of says it all, I think, in terms of a global um, um, picture of the energy system. This is the global energy mix, and, and this is uh, the most recent data <clears throat> from, the, from the Statistical Re Review of World Energy. This is global uh, split out, and I think the first observation is that the mix isn't much of a mix. Right? It's really fossil fuels heavy here. So you've got oil, coal, and gas representing over 80% of our primary energy use that we use as in the world. And then hydro, nuclear, wind, and, and solar. And solar, I should mention, is up impressively up to one and a bit percent. It's still small globally, but the growth is really impressive. Um, of course, in Ontario, we don't have this piece, right? So we've got some great policies that have removed this from our electricity production. But globally, this is our, our current mix. And, and of course, the concern of this is that it produces about 35 or more billion tons of CO2 per year. And that's a big number. Uh, but 1% of the atmospheric total. And there's a nice example. <clears throat> there's a few of these around the world, but this is one I like. And it shows you what one ton of CO2 looks like physically. It's a very big ball of gas, right? And one ton of CO2, do you guys have a sense for your global, or pardon me, for your carbon footprint? Does anyone know their carbon footprint roughly? Can you take a guess? Anyone want to guess? I won't, I'll, I won't make fun of you if you're wrong. Would you be one ton, 10 tons, 100 tons per year? What do you think? 127. 127. Ron, you, you have an elaborate lifestyle, but we all know that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, no, I, I'd, I'd put Ron at around 10, between 10 and 20. Depends how much he flies, frankly. Okay, so, so we've got a question of scale, and this haunts me a little bit because I'm an engineer and I want to have impact, and I know I have to have impact ultimately on these scales. Um, what can we do? This is a, a, a fun picture that points to the challenge of scale and energy systems. Can anyone guess what this person is doing? They're stealing something. Does anyone know what it is? 
It's a balloon light, not on like on the last slide, but they're not stealing CO2, this is natural gas. And this is about as much natural gas as in terms of total energy as it'll take to get me from downtown to here and back. Um, uh, the car I was in, uh, the Uber I was in is burping oil, but, but this is a volume um, challenge. So this Nature article in 2018, to me, sums up everything we need to know about the energy system and, and, and the future uh, of the energy system. We've got rising pressures. We've got lots of available CO2 because those big sources I pointed to aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Lots of reductions, lots of exciting stuff, but they're still very prevalent and will be for many years for most of our lifetimes in this room. One other big change is that solar energy is becoming very affordable, right? Big changes in the solar energy uh, system. This is a combination of great ingenuity and also just uh, manufacturing efficiencies, driving the cost down. So this is an exciting change. So there's, there's lots of CO2 being produced, yes, but there's lots of renewable low energy or low cost renewable electrons being produced as well. And then the third pane here shows that, yeah, this demand is going to be long term, right? There's long term demand for hydrocarbons. Um, and chemical feedstocks in our world. So the, the, the point of our conversion project is, hey, can we take this CO2 and treat it as a feedstock and use the available renewable electrons to turn it back into the hydrocarbons we need? So that's the approach. This would have been total insanity um, even 10 years ago because it was missing this piece. Where does the energy come from, right? It brings CO2 back into hydrocarbons. It's like combustion in reverse. How do we do this? We do this with an electrochemical cell, and uh, it looks a lot like a fuel cell, if, if, if people are familiar with that technology. Gases reacting on electrocatalytic surface. Here we take electricity in, so we don't produce electricity, we take electricity in, uh, and we take water in and CO2, and then we produce fuels and feedstocks and oxygen as products. The vision, of course, is that we can close the carbon cycle on the near term, what we're actually doing is taking industrial power emissions. There's lots of these, right? Um, uh, lots of point sources of CO2 in universities, but in, in, in plants and buildings all around the world, of course. Take that CO2 and convert it using electricity and some water into chemicals and feedstocks that, that you can sell or use directly. Ultimately, this could be in a, in a full closed loop, one can imagine, right, where there's direct air capture as well. Perhaps some of you are familiar with that technology where you can take CO2 directly from the air. That's becoming better and better. So you can imagine uh, CO2 from the air converted into something useful like a fuel for storage and back around in the loop. Where's U of T's technology in this um, space? So we partnered with the Sargent Group. My group works on the catalyst systems, kind of the hardware stuff. In the Sargent Group, uh, some of you may know, they're world experts in catalysis science and material science. And, and what's been fun is working together on this challenge because maybe five years ago or 10 years ago, you could do your catalysis science in this area in your lab with your beakers, and that was good enough. But the field is advanced, the technology is advanced to the point where the system where you, you are working in uh, impacts the performance of the, the catalyst, if that makes sense. So if you've got a great catalyst, the only way to show it to the world is to have a great system built around it. Great transport for electrons and re reactants and products. So we build those systems. And, and this is a case, this is, it was published in Science in 2018, and it's my favorite example of, of systems, transport, mechanical engineering students thinking about how to move reactants around, how to get them to react, chemical engineering students, and then material chemists making it happen with really clever nanomaterials. What is the Carbon X Prize? So the Carbon X Prize is, it reminds me a little bit of the, the LEED program um, designations we heard earlier, right? What, we talked about LEED program, uh, gold and platinum and bronze and silver, maybe no bronze, um, this morning. And why did those come up? Those come up because they, it's, a, it's a competition of sorts, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's um, defined metrics that, that uh, facilities at U of T and around the world can work to meet. It's a competition in a sense, if that makes sense. Carbon X Prize is, has a similar sort of idea. It's a competition around converting CO2, right? So taking CO2, not just producing yet less of it, but converting it into useful products. And it's kind of, uh, it's funded by NRG and COSIA, and there's a bunch of different uh, X Prizes that have been done. There's been space ones and other competitions. The carbon one is pretty wide open. It's saying, whatever technology, we don't care, 
the tech winning technology will be the one that converts the CO2 to something valuable most efficiently. Transforming CO2 into valuable product. $20 million competition. Uh, we've made it through multiple rounds. We, really the student group that's been behind this has made it through multiple rounds of, uh, of the competition. We're now in the finals. There's, uh, there's 10 teams total. Five are competing at a, at a coal plant in Wyoming. Five are gonna be in Calgary at a natural gas uh, um, site and eating those CO2 emissions from those power plants and turning them into a variety of materials. Some groups, are, some teams are making building materials. Uh, we're making fuels and feedstocks, but the idea is the winning team is gonna make the most valuable stuff and they're gonna make it the most efficient. So our team of students, um, this is, this is uh, the current group and it's led by Christine Gabardo, who's my postdoctoral fellow and uh, as well as the sergeant group members here, Alex Zip is a, is a key player as is Tao and a few others. And this is a very committed uh, student team and we'll talk about some of the project, some of the progress they've made here. You know, starting from the lab scale a few years ago, that's what these things look like. They're just little wee devices, right? The idea is you can test your catalyst out and, and get some sense for how you're, how you're doing. <clears throat> the next scale up was, was, was in, in the end of 2017. So that was a prototype. It was kind of a closet sized uh, system, but, it, but it, it showed proof of concept that we could run um, uh, a few plates in a stack and about the size of a large refrigerator in terms of plant size. Where we're moving is to a pilot plant that both has to convert more and it has to be stable production for over 30 days, 24 hours a day. Um, it has to be a facility, not a research uh, device. And over, I believe it's, uh, it's uh, over 100 days of continuous, uh, not 24 hours a day operation, but, but plant in operation. And I, I mentioned our, our partners here, CERT is the name of the team, that's Carbon Electro, uh, Catalytic Recycling Toronto. University of Toronto is a key partner here, as we'll be talking about. And then and Total also. Total is, a, is an industry uh, partner um, that, is, that is sort of completes the triangle here between great students, great IP, industry that can help uh, scale this technology ultimately, and a university as, as, a, as a partner in growing the tech, but and also in, uh, as an end user. So the challenge for us is, is, is electrodes, clever electrode systems. I highlighted one of my favorites earlier, getting those into big cells, right? So these are, these are large, I'm gonna have a slide on that in a second, cells into plants. So this is a pilot plant, a skid plant, and then that plant to site. So this site is, they don't provide very, it's a, the XPRIZE is a glamorous global prize, but they don't provide a very glamorous um, welcome for us. It's a gravel pad. <laughs> and they say, great, you're, the pipe of CO2 is here. And uh, you know, here's some utilities, and uh, the rest is on you. So it's a this is this is just a mock-up. There's one building on site here, and our building is going up on, on site number three. So this is our pad. That's where we have to make this magic happen over the next uh, few months. Give you a look at what these stacks look like. So this is a this is a one prototype stack. So this is the full scale. It's 800 centimeters squared. Uh, there's 10 of those, and we've we've uh, um, delegated the construction of the pilot plant to, uh, to a company that builds pilot plants every day. Uh, but the stacks we've really done in-house because we, we felt that we had to, um, given the, the, the state of the technology and given the turnaround time and the pressures of the competition timelines. So there's five stacks here, uh, five stacks of, of 10 cells of 800 centimeters squared. These are being built at U of T. And this is, uh, this is a senior PhD student on the team, Jonathan. And uh, I've requested that Jonathan find someone smaller to take a picture with the cell because Jonathan's a very big fellow. Um, but anyway, needless to say, these are big. Uh, they weigh a lot <coughs> to, the, to the extent where, you know, for the first time in my career, we've had safety shoes requirements in the lab, right? Because even one cell, uh, 800 centimeter squared cell, if dropped on your foot could be really uh, problematic. How big are these things? This is the scales that we were at and, and a lot of the field is at right now, right? Sort of, sort of five centimeters squared, good for testing. Uh, largest scale in the literature that you can find is three cells put together and that's about 61 total. Um, Harvard has a, has a cell that's 100 centimeters squared, one single cell, it's not a stack. 
Um, this is our round two, four cells combined, proof of concept. Electrolysis is, is, uh, is producing hydrogen technology. It's more mature than us. And uh, the largest um, or a typical cell is on the order of systems, on the order of 700. We're at 800 centimeters squared and 50 of those. And so this is a big um, departure in terms of scaling. And I mentioned the importance of scale. It's also a little bit humbling because we realize to go from here to global impact, more orders of magnitude, yeah. But this is, hopefully I've got, I haven't confused you too much, that in terms of, in terms of the technology walking towards large scales, we've made large leaps here. It's really the competition that's enabled us to do this, to raise this money, to engage these students, to, uh, to take on this, this very significant scaling effort. And this is the pilot plant. So this is this, I love this thing. It's really been cool to see it come together. So this is um, in, in production at Zeton, not too far from here. They're in Burlington. And uh, <clears throat> you know, this is all to, to our specs, but they're professional plant builders. They've done a nice job of this so far. It's all tubing. It's all just this uh, engineering buffet of tubing and, and uh, wires and, and controllers and monitors and it's glorious. And hopefully it's a winner, we'll see. But you can imagine the, the, the cells stacking in here, one, two, three, four, five, around here. There'll be four running at any given time and the fifth one's being swapped out, hardware, um, et cetera. And there's some students here. Great, so the vision is uh, win in Calgary and take home millions of dollars um, and then bring this home to Toronto and bring this home to U of T facilities and uh, we're working with, with, um, with Ron and Paul and thinking about where this could go and where this could become a facility, um, not just for us, but for, but for all carbon technologies being developed in the university, right? How can the university embody this tech and, and, and serve as a living lab to develop it further and other technology in the carbon conversion area? One place, you know, early on we thought, hey, um, in engineering, we have a lot of affection for the central plant. It is, as Ron pointed out, it really is a, a glorious thing, right, in terms of efficiencies, centralization, things that engineers do really well. Um, but it turns out, you know, this, this could be one location, but there's other uh, areas that, that, uh, that the facilities folks have in mind that might be a better fit in terms of scaling and, and really facilitate this as a learning lab. I personally really like U of T Mississauga. I think it's lovely out here. I've come to appreciate that today. So, uh, so I think I'm, I'm going to vote for UTM, maybe, or maybe UT Scarborough. I don't. We'll go to the we'll go to the highest bidder for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll end with uh, just one last point on scale, and I guess I'm paranoid about scale because we've come a long way. We've got a long way to go. Um, I come back to the words of, of David McKay, who is a, who is a Cambridge um, intellectual in, in energy, and he's got a great point. I think that helps me think about what energy challenges to work on. And he says, if we all do a little, we'll accomplish a little, right? So you really have to work on things that are big and think, how can this possibly be big? And the carbon challenge helps us with that thinking because gigaton scale technologies are what are ultimately needed. Um, great, so hopefully I've, I've communicated that CO2 is a challenge of enormous scales and, and uh, the challenge is in a path, building a pathway to address that. Gigaton CO2 impact will require leveraging current infrastructure and markets and technologies that are operating at scale. Maybe I didn't emphasize this enough, but um, Rob, I've got, I've got 60 more seconds. Um, when I first got thinking about carbon conversion, I was thinking, well, you just want to make cool stuff. And you hear, um, you know, you, you see papers uh, in high profile journals, hey, CO2 converted to sunglasses. I use the example sunglasses, but you know, some sort of cool material, some sort of niche material. That sounds like a cool technology, right? Sun, sunglasses made out of CO2. But wait, how many tons of sunglasses did you buy last year? Anybody? Subton, right? <laughs> I hope subton. You know, whatever. Maybe you didn't buy sunglasses last year. Maybe you bought 100 grams of sunglasses last year. You only bought tons of a few things, right? You used tons of water. That's true right? Water doesn't have any carbon in it. Um, what else did you use tons of? You used tons of fuels and you used tons of feedstocks, ultimately, right? So we have to make those big things in order to have carbon impact. That makes sense. So you got to look to the big things. And when you look to the big things, you look to big industry. 
And then you think, okay, well, big industry is already doing a pretty good job at efficiencies at running the plant the way we currently do it, produces lots of CO2. Is there solutions that we can snap in to that? right? A CO2 conversion to put that CO2 back into these useful fuels, into the stuff that these guys are refining, ethanol, ethylene, propanol, products that we use tons of, not sunglasses. U of T is an emerging leader in sustainable technology. So there's cool initiatives. This is an example on the downtown campus. University faculty and students and industry partners are leading the development and deployment of viable, scalable electrocatalytic CO2 conversion systems. It's early days, but I think we're pointed in the right direction and we're fortunate to have the XPRIZE both as a, as a great opportunity, it's a great challenge, but it really um, brings the team and the people and the partners together to, to make a leap in scaling that frankly a professor couldn't do otherwise. So uh, thanks, to, thanks to facilities and thanks for your attention. Perfect. Thank you very much, David. And maybe just to, to emphasize, I think this was quite an exciting project that we want to highlight because it is very much a, a partnership and that uh, this is one of the few projects that, that you'll see that uh, not only have we partnered with, with our academic colleagues, but what we've invested in, in this technology, uh, put, uh, we actually attend all the monthly meetings to help uh, co-develop, especially how do we start to attach it to, to in the real world type applications. And it's one that we're, we're rather excited about as being part of our strategy. So thank you very much. Um, we've got about 15, 20 minutes left, and we thought we would open it up for a bit of a panel discussion. So, um, you know, if there's any questions, maybe now's the best time to do that. And I'll, and I'll take a seat and, and help answer the questions too. Please. Uh, question for David. Oh, sure. So in, in, uh, in our competition, what we make, that's again, the most valuable thing we can possibly make that has a global market uh, that we can make efficiency, efficiently is ethylene. So that's a, that's a feedstock, you know, general petrochemical feedstock. It goes into lots of things, including plastics. Um, ethanol also is a feedstock in some processes, but it's more of a fuel. We make that as well. We're a little better at the ethylene, so we're focused on, that's our bigger piece, but yeah, that's the combination. We can make a bunch of other ones, you know, formate, there's sort of a hierarchy. Um, everyone, and then we rank them in terms of how well we can make them, well in terms of efficiently, and then how expensive they are. So products that are used to make other products. Products that are used to make other products. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Yeah, so I mean, on the first point, the um, if you're if you're supplying ethanol for for your Uber vehicle to get back downtown or or other feedstock, and you're doing so with CO two that comes from the air, then you're not you're not taking it from another source. Does that make sense? So you're not you're not burning fuel that you, you burned out of the, you took out of the ground. So you're avoiding that fossil uh, input. Does that make sense? You have to, the only way to make that equation work is have a, have a bunch of energy from somewhere else. And where is it somewhere else in our case it has to be renewable electrons. Does that make sense? So, um, go ahead. Well, maybe I can, maybe I'll flip that question on its head and answer more from an operations perspective. So it depends what study you, you, you believe uh, or which one you follow. They say that by the year 2050, about 80% of the buildings uh, that are gonna be here already exist today. So when I think of carbon capture and the reason why we've decided to make this partnership, I see it very much as a transitional uh, strategy at first and that 80% of the buildings are gonna be here. That means 80% of the problem is gonna be here. So being able to build all of our buildings net zero and, and all that's gonna be great and it's gonna help, but it's only gonna help with that 10 or 20%. It's not gonna help with the 80% that's already here today. So I think that this is a great uh, project from that perspective because it helps us start that transition over. Um, the other piece, uh, and maybe technology will answer this in the wholeness of times, but we've got very interesting weather peaks in this environment, especially where we are in Toronto. And the type of renewal technologies, geo exchange or geothermal heat pump technologies, they aren't at the point where they can help us to deal with those extremes. So if you were to, to try to design a, a net zero building, even today, it's going to be next to impossible without doing it with some form of electricity or natural gas to deal with those peaks. So, so I think 
Um, things like carbon capture are definitely going to help us in that 20 to 40 year per, uh, time frame for both transition and dealing with the peaks. And so that technology helps us get there. But it has a life beyond that. I think David's got a great point that there's core sources of carbon beyond just the effluent gas from a boiler. Right? There's carbon that exists out in the air. Uh, so, so those are other sort of opportunities. And there's a growing sense that we, we do need to go negative, as they call it, in terms of CO2 emissions. Sometimes in climate models, what that negative piece is, is burying CO2. Um, so we're just going to have to bury a bunch of it. And, and that's, that's less attractive, generally. There's been, a, there's been a movement away from that for lots of reasons. Um, but, uh, but the idea of converting it to something useful and to something, to Ron's point, that you can store um, is, is attractive. Please. Uh, very much appreciate all the presentations. I think they were useful and somewhat helpful. I just have um, two questions, one kind of pragmatic one and one a little bit holistic. On the pragmatic level, uh, I've heard and perhaps I've heard correctly that things on a surface area are in the background. So um, now if we put carbon on underneath the ground surface, mm -hmm. uh, if that's the case, how does that fit in with this carbon structure? The second question is a more holistic one in terms of wellness. And I uh, really appreciate what you talked about the trail at Scarborough. Um, you did the first one with a uh, large uh, central wellness on campus. And it takes in such an important portion of nature and that of fuel and that of human production and non human production, such an important element of wellness of the human structure. So I'm wondering to what extent. This kind of question fit in, uh, whether that means daylighting, cattle creek, or building uh, areas with more green spaces for our food, and also dwelling in environment, which has changed the dynamics of it. So, how does that fit in? So, well, maybe I'll tackle the, the King's College Circle question first, and then we can have a, a discussion on the, the wellness aspects. Um, it just so happens that it was today or yesterday that the uh, UFT News released an article that talks exactly about the, what the question that you had around how does that, what we call the landmark project, <coughs> interact with the GeoExchange project. And um, I guess to, and you weren't, so I, I'm assuming your question is not so much about the technical interaction. Yes, there'll be a parking lot, and yes, there'll be wells underneath. But how does the notion of building a parking lot it, it meld with what we want to do from a low carbon action plan perspective? Well, first, the numbers themselves, parking lot actually is going to be about half the size of the available parking that we currently have uh, in that area of the campus. Most people, some people cringe when I say that, oh, great, now I've got to find more parking. But uh, we're, we're actively aware of the fact that we have a commuter campus, we've got four subway stations on our campus, and we're trying to promote uh, more sustainable and responsible forms of transport. But the spots that we do have in place, I think it's important to note that uh, it's designed to be 100% electric vehicle charging stations. On opening day, we're projecting only 50. Uh, there's a wide variety of reasons for, for why that is, but 50% of those parking spots would be uh, ready and uh, to commute electric vehicle charging. So our, our mindset has shifted very much from a traditional type of approaches to how do we ensure we accommodate the transportation modes of the future, both promoting public transit, but also uh, investing in areas of around the EV charging. We even have some really interesting uh, research projects and discussions, uh, not so much about how we're going to charge the vehicles, <coughs> but can we use those vehicles that will be in our parking lot as battery storage uh, to help us shave some of our peaks so people can charge at home and then we'll pay them to park with us so we could use the, that, uh, that electricity during the day and start to shift some of that um, consumption from very high carbon times, which occurs during the peak of the day, to lower carbon times uh, from an electric grid perspective. Anyways, all of those are more in the theoretical type research areas right now, but the, the pragmatic question is, or answer is that uh, it's very much going to be electric vehicle focused with 50% of those spots uh, ready for that. And if, if I jump in, maybe I'll, I'll take the uh, where, where you left off on parking um, and then a answer the, the second question. So for us at UTSC, parking is a huge challenge. Uh, four times in my tenure have we had an LRT funded um, that was meant to connect the broader um, uh, high-speed transit system to the campus, and four times it's been withdrawn for various political reasons. Uh, and so there's no choice but to provide parking because we have 800 buses a day that come to the campus, but they don't service the catchment area where our students come from, right? Uh, 
and and that's because there's three different transit systems and the transit systems don't like each other and nobody wants to get them to talk and so we have to build a thousand spot parking structures so that we can free up land so that we can actually uh, develop the campus um so that's we do need to provide parking because we need to we do need to be respectful for them. people need to get to campus to your second question around wellness um it's certainly a key theme for the campus that we have these uh, truly great spaces. There's a, you know, the literature is telling us that um, out, being out in open spaces actually helps ground people, um, helps connect them, helps them feel better. Uh, but the, the other piece is that the green space actually matters for the quality of the experience on campus. Um, walking, we have the advantage of building a new campus. So it, it gives us the opportunity to connect buildings with open green spaces. It has the ability to let people connect to the four seasons that we have. Uh, in the city, 30% of our population is international. A great majority of them have never seen snow, right? So they get very excited when winter comes. Um, they also get, you know, in November when it gets to be zero degrees, they're thinking, boy, this is cold. And then it's always funny to see their faces in January when it's minus 20. Um, but we want to, we want people to express and, and feel that. I think also doing things inside the buildings uh, is, is the next area that we're turning to. We've done some green. Uh, walls and living walls and, and there's other technologies that are coming online to help connect uh, people um, and so we also with our buildings try to connect the natural landscape um, from the inside of the building to the outside of the building so you have great views and, and connections so it's a really key piece of how we think about our new projects. I just to pick on Andrew and I know I, uh, I went through my presentation really quickly because you, you'll be just be hearing about UTM throughout the day and what UTM does. Um, but picking on parking, we have to because uh, unlike downtown, the access to uh, public transit is not as great on the east and west side as it's to downtown. Um, and sometimes to uh, the availability of, of uh, residences and other things that come anyhow. Um, but what we have to change is our thinking. And that's what I was talking about and I talked about in the morning. <coughs> um, I talked a little bit in, in my presentation is we do have to provide parking. So this week, everybody found parking because it's sweeping week. Come here next week, and if you're a little bit late, then then good luck parking, finding a parking. So we do have to provide parking. Our next building that is actually on the drawing board now and, and will be built just outside of here, we've come up with an innovative way of providing parking. We, are no, we know the technologies are coming. We know the self-driving vehicles are coming in. And so we're building a parking that can be converted back into usable space when the right time comes in. So we have to have that futuristic thinking and not limit ourselves to today. When we are building, when we are doing things, we need to take it to uh, building a future for our kids and grandkids and, 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 and mother, other generations that will come to this planet. Um, again, uh, even on the academic side, uh, well-being, as you said, as long as the weather permits, we have professors who would do outdoor classes. So every week we see a notification that goes out to the community and saying so-and-so professor is actually taking a class outside. So it's walking. We have nature walks. So we're doing, but again, uh, we have to do a lot more. All is it to thinking about the stock that's here, 80%, but the 20% will also be very important. That's coming in the future. We probably have time for one more question. If that's out there. Okay, Mark. Oh, please. I was just wondering about food and like how that So food, a very important question. Um, as I said, we are trying vertical farming, little by little, lot to do. Um, but there is a lot of food that is generated where the food is actually cooked. And in our residences when the kids, so we have and our, our director of sustainability sitting just beside you. Waste management is an area we're working very closely. A uh, couple of challenges is we divert the waste stream here. How does the waste stream get picked from here? So those are the things that we're working with our partners, the city and, and, and others. But wherever the food is generated, we try to com put, uh, provide compost right there. We are trying to pro produce things like mint and, uh, and other coriander in our vertical farms so that we don't have to go and get them from outside. Plus we are refreshing the, 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 the indoor air quality. So uh, multiple things, straws that I talked about, little things, fair trade commitment, 
is another thing. I actually am personally going to a conference later, uh, not this month, but next, early next month, is where we will learn about how do we do better uh, and in, in, in generating and, and composting um, waste. So not generating more, but, but doing better in, in uh, finding uh, recycling uh, waste. And we've done quite a bit with rooftop gardening. And then last year we opened a campus farm, which is a five acre um, plot of land that we dedicated to create a permaculture farm on campus. Uh, and more recently, we're working with a uh, part of Centennial College and we'll build a six story vertical farm, industrial scale farm, which will be both a teaching a, a facility and a research facility. Um, and a lot of that is connected with the local growers. We've been working closely with the Rouge National Urban Park uh, in terms of how food production uh, can help uh, positively affect a great number of the food deserts we have, particularly in the suburbs, right? So there's parts of the suburbs where it's uh, fresh, healthy foods just aren't available, right? Um, and, and our community has come to us to say, is there anything we can do to help? So we're doing quite a bit now with food and food production. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to our, our panelists for, for your time today. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.